Hey friends, welcome back to Embrace the Question. It's good to see you. I'm in my study. I'm ready to go. It's time to get into Genesis chapter 6, the second half, which is a very meaty half of a chapter. If you're new here, welcome. If you're looking for a long-term, in-depth Bible study, don't forget to subscribe because you can get in on this. I really have enjoyed all of the conversation surrounding this particular study. I think you're enjoying it. I haven't heard of anyone that isn't so far. So if you've got your Bible handy and a notebook, maybe a highlighter or two, then let's get started. If you're new, I should let you know that we are using eSword. It is a free piece of software. It is absolutely fantastic. Most everything that you download through eSword is free. If there are some commentaries or Bible versions, translations that you like that aren't free, then you can also purchase those, I believe, through eSword and download those and have those at your disposal. You'll notice here at the top, ASV, Darby, English majority text version, easy to read version. These are all my translations that I have downloaded. And at the the last couple of tabs here, one is compare, which allows you to compare a verse through all the different translations, including, as you can see, the Hebrew Old Testament. Or you can look at these in parallel and I have my text blown way up so that you can see it. So not everything is fitting on the screen precisely, but it also gives you that flexibility. So I find it to be a really good tool. Whenever we select a verse, the, uh, the let's see, like Genesis 6-1, for instance, the commentaries that have specifics on Genesis 6-1 will pop up over here on the right with a little blue eye. You can see that little guy right there. That means that the Sermon Bible has notes on Genesis 6.1. Uh, F.B. Meyer has the same notes, MHCC. That's Matthew Henry's commentary. So, or there's Matthew Hen Henry's. What is this one? Concise commentary. So there are two Matthew Henry commentaries downloaded on my computer. But you're welcome to go over here to the download and come down. You can download maps, and that sometimes includes uh, picture books, uh, historical picture books, that type of thing, uh, devotionals, dictionaries, commentaries, Bibles. You can see all of that. But this is a cool package. Just wanted to give a brief plug for that again. Again, it's free, so jet out to e-sword.net and you can pick it up. All right. We left off right here with verse 10. I'm going to continue with the KJV Plus because it gives me immediate access to these Hebrew words. So we left off with verse 10 where Noah begat his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The earth was filled with violence. Now, I'm going to make this disclaimer that the earth wasn't as populated as it is today, as far as the people just haven't had a chance to move across the earth. But this is a pre-flood earth. So, what the damage done by the flood had not yet occurred, meaning the, uh, the, the seas were different, the mountain ranges were different, and therefore the natural boundaries were different. So people were migrating into different places. A lot of uh, creation scientists believe that the, the ice caps were not as they are today. So that is definitely worthy of a study in itself. Uh, there is a man that will be named later. His name is Peleg, and it was in his day. If we if we do a quick look, a quick look, 
I'm having trouble speaking. There is no doubt about that. We have a quick look for this guy named Peleg. And we will see right there. We're coming on. We're coming up on Genesis 10, 25. And unto Eber, for whom the Hebrews were named, Hebrews, were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Why was the earth divided? Because the waters of the flood were assuaging. They were going down. So the earth was was forming natural boundaries in that day. The earth was also corrupt before God and filled with violence. <clears throat> violence is Hamas. Hamas. Have you heard um, you heard of the group Hamas? It is Hebrew violence, Hamas. This says Chamas, but it's the same, it's the same basic root, Chamas. Verse 12. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I want you to keep in mind that every time God is wanting to create something new, there is going to be a destruction of the old. That has to do with the earth. In this, the, the earth, in this case, was a picture of you and I, because we have to be born again. There has to be a new creature. There's the old wineskin, the new wineskin can't put new new wine into an old wine skin you have to put it into a new one therefore you have to create something new okay you have to have a new creation and that's what we're talking about more than destruction we're probably ultimately talking about rebirth although this is written from a guy who Moses who didn't have a real grid for what this rebirth looked like so his focus is very much on the destruction part all right. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and you will pitch it within and without with pitch. Look at this word pitch. It's gopher. Properly, a cover or a village, bitumen, is, is perhaps what's even used in your translation. Something that's used for coating, like tar, perhaps. Figuratively, though, a redemption price, a bribe, a camphor, a ransom, a sum of money. That's why, that's what makes this language so amazing, is that what we're talking about here is... Redemption. Redemption. What what do we mean? Coat the ark on the inside and the out. You will pitch it within and without. That means there's going to be redemption on the outside and redemption on the inside. The similarities with the Ark of the Covenant are very profound. The Ark of the Covenant was a box made of acacia wood, I believe, but parts of it were solid gold. The, the parts of the top were solid gold. The interesting thing about the bottom piece is that it was gold on the inside and gold on the outside. Get it? You're, when you're redeemed, you're redeemed through and through. You're redeemed on the outside and you're redeemed on the inside. You're redeemed completely. So this is yet another picture. Pitch is another word for redemption. Definitely worth your notes. Uh, you're going to do that inside, and you're going to do that on the outside. I, for some reason, you know, Moses comes to mind again because he was placed in a basket and placed in the river. He was placed in an ark. Uh, and I haven't read that lately. I don't know if his mother pitched that on the inside and on the outside, but that would be interesting to know. And this is the fashion which thou make it, thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. 
in the Hebraic numerology, the zeros matter a lot less than the preceding numbers. So what I what I see here is three, five, and three. The significance of that, of course, three, the, the, the number of completion or perfection, the triune God. Uh, but also, five is the number of grace, the number of the law in this case. So when you're when you're talking about numerology, you can you can make it a little more complex, like three tens or thirty or five tens for fifty, and then get into what what are the tens, the commands, the law. That's another that's another number for law is the ten commandments. Okay, so that's pretty deep if you want to get into the numerology. As for what it means in the building of the ark, we could probably spend a long time on that particular subject. Let's look at verse 16 here. A window shall you make to the ark, and in a cubit shall you finish it above. And the door of the ark shall you set in the side thereof, lower second and third shall you make it. Okay, we need to switch around to a different translation that is actually in English. Let's try the ESV and see what it is. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in, in its side. Make it with lower second and third decks. That's almost correct. Let's take another look here. Make a window for the boat, about a one cubit below the roof. The easy-to-read version got it right of all of them. Put a door in the side of the boat. Make, the, make three floors in the boat, a top deck, a middle deck, and a lower deck. So put a window in it, about a cubit below the roof. What does that mean? That means they set a window up right underneath the roof. So every time they wanted to look out, they weren't looking straight out on the destruction around them. They were always looking up. They were always looking up. That is a profound statement. Whenever you're surrounded with trouble, the last thing you need to do is keep your eyes on the destruction around you or the turmoil or the chaos or whatever's going on in your life. You need to keep your eyes up. That is a lesson from Genesis chapter 6. All right, let's go to verse 17. Understand what I'm telling you. Should we read it all in our easy-to-read version? Understand what I'm telling you. I will bring a great flood of water on the earth. I will destroy all living things that live under heaven. Everything on the earth will die. Let's just be consistent. Behold, even I, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein the breath of life, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that, in, that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. I want to say this right now because it's so obvious and it's in my line of sight, but God only deals with man through covenant. He dealt with Adam and Eve through covenant. He deals with Noah through covenant. He later deals with Abraham through covenant. He'll deal with Israel through a covenant. And then he'll deal lastly the last covenant that god will make is through his son the only one that can keep it okay so these are all for the most part blood covenants i don't know of any that are not blood covenants but this one is one of the first the, the noahic covenant it's referred to quite often and uh and this is the introduction to it with you i'm going to establish a covenant Okay, and of every living thing of all flesh 
Two of every sort shall you bring into the ark to keep alive and with you. They shall be male and female. We'll learn that God's actually establishing a covenant with creation as well here. Okay. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, his kind. Two of every sort shall come into to thee to keep them alive. Okay, so everything that is clean, there's going to be seven. Everything that's unclean, there's going to be two. It's not all two straight across. It's seven clean, two of unclean. All right. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and you will gather to you, and it shall be food for you and for them. Whew. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Just so we can get that really, really good in our spirit here. Let's read those last few verses with the easy to read version. Understand what I'm telling you. I will bring a great flood of water on the earth. I will destroy all living things that live under heaven. Everything on the earth will die. I will make a special agreement with you. Your, you, your wife, your sons, and their wives will all go into the boat. Also, you will take two of every living thing on the earth with you in the boat. Take a male and female of every kind of animal so they might survive with you. Two of every kind of bird animal and creeping thing will come to you so that you might keep them alive and also bring every kind of food into the boat for you and for the animals. Noah did everything God commanded him. That's what's interesting about that is they didn't even mention the sevens. And actually I misspoke because the rest of this is explained in the next chapter. Seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. Seven pairs. Let's see if the King James agrees with that. You will take the by sevens. Oh, by sevens. Doesn't say seven pairs. It says by sevens. And beasts that are not clean by two. So we will get to that next time. That wraps up chapter 6. So we were able to see that God is making a covenant with Noah, that Noah is building this boat with specific dimensions. The dimensions are huge. If you've never really taken a look at the dimensions of the ark, the ark was larger than the Titanic. I'm sure you've seen the comparison. Uh, three floors in it. Can you imagine being on a boat with so many animals with one window. One window. It, it had to be well ventilated, I'm going to guess. You're saying, well, why did, you know, how did Noah do all of this? I'm sure that God built into this deal a certain amount of himself bringing animals to Noah. I don't know that for a fact. It would have been quite a chore for Noah to wrangle all of these animals. It's really easy to get into the dinosaur discussion here. Were there dinosaurs pre-flood? I believe there were. Were there dinosaurs post-flood? I believe that there were. Then what happened to the dinosaurs? And how in the world did Noah get them on the boat? Again, I think Noah might have had some help, especially with the larger animals. However, you're not going to take the old, fully grown adults on a boat ride with you if you can get the babies. Why? Because the babies eat less, they create less waste, they eat less, they, they, uh, they sleep more. <laughs> they sleep more. So what you want is the most peaceful experience you can have with large animals. So you're going to take the ones that are hopefully the most docile, right? The ones that are willing to sleep, and perhaps the spirit of sleep was on the boat. I don't know. I mean, there's really a lot of details that we're not going to have until we get to ask Noah. But uh, that would have been for every living creature to have two of the clean and or two of the unclean and seven of the clean. Whew, that's a lot of animals. So this was a very large boat, and it had to carry 
a lot of weight and it had to carry a lot of food for all of these beings. Uh, back to the dinosaurs, what, what happened to them afterwards? Well, Noah resettled the earth, right? Everything started with Noah and his family. So the, the animals were not afraid of Noah and his family until after the flood. That's what scripture says. At that point, the animals dispersed and began to multiply. The people did the same. The families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth did the exact same thing. They started to settle here, settle here, settle here. There weren't a ton of animals to hunt yet. So what did they hunt? They hunted the biggest animals they could find. If there were dinosaurs, those would have been the targets. Right? You can feed an entire village on a single dinosaur for a very, very long time. <clears throat> so, that would have been target number one is a triceratops if you can get him. Otherwise, we're going to have to eat monkey again. And that doesn't feed a whole lot of toddlers if you're talking about a village. So these are just things to ponder because there is, again, a lot of mythology saying that dinosaurs were, in fact, the pets of kings in, in the days of, say, Nebuchadnezzar and these other kings, these other very powerful men that were rulers in the earth during those early days. Nebuchadnezzar would have been, I think there was one historical writing that said that he owned a dragon. What would a dragon have been? Would have been a dinosaur. It would have been a small one probably, but a dinosaur nonetheless. Uh, and then we have all of the Chinese tradition that is very much about dragons and mythology. Where did all that come from? I think it's very plausible that it all came from dinosaurs and things that were killed off early because men were expanding. And that you just you just killed the most viable food source. All right, so this I know brings up a lot of interesting questions, bound to be some uh, people that have other views, and that is absolutely fine. But I hope that you're enjoying Genesis chapter 6, because Genesis chapter 7 is going to be still the beginning of the flood. All right. So we will do that in the next couple of days. Hope you all have a great and blessed weekend. Peace.